Let's take a look at Gmetrics practice exam one, questions one through eight. Our first task in Gmetrics is a fill in the blank. We're going to choose a couple options from these drop down menus. This question is talking about the difference between a raw photograph and a compressed photograph or JPEG photograph. When you're talking about image quality and these different formats, we can think of this almost like having different sizes of buckets. In a small bucket, it takes up less space, but you can't hold as much in it compared to a large bucket. The large bucket is going to take up a lot more space, but you can fit a lot more things inside of it. Our JPEG photo is just like this small bucket. It's great for being small and being easy to share. It takes up a little bit of file size, but not a whole lot, and you can still fit some stuff in it. While that large bucket is going to be your raw format, where you can fit in a ton of information, a ton of data, but it's a little bit harder to share around. So the main downside of using a raw photograph is that it's a much larger file size compared to a JPEG. So in this example here, a blank file is unpressed and, or unprocessed and contains more data than a standard blank file. In this case, you're looking for a raw file is unprocessed and contains more data than a standard JPEG file because this is that bigger bucket with more data. We'll go ahead and press next to check our answer. And we were correct. On this next question here, this is a question about target audience. The question reads, which option is not a factor when determining which kind of image to include in your project for a target audience? Is it the age of the audience, your own stylistic preference, desired goals of the client, and the purpose of the project? content. You really need to get into the head of somebody who is working for a client in this situation. What your client cares about and what they like might not match up with your own personal taste and own personal preference. At the end of the day, they're the ones hiring you and the ones paying you, so they are the ones in charge. The only one of these where it doesn't line up necessarily with the goals of the client is your own stylistic preference. We'll go ahead and select that and choose next. And that is correct. We'll move on. Next question, since you are working with photographs you received from the client, you don't want any editing changes to be permanent. What type of editing would you use if you wanted to preserve the original image data? The option given to us is safe editing, duplicative editing, non-destructive editing, or non-permanent editing. So there's a couple different options here, and they all sound very similar. This is a question that's not designed as a trick question, meant to test your vocabulary knowledge. Safe editing is not really a term that is used in this space, so we can toss that one out. Next up, we have duplicative editing. Again, this is a term that we don't really use. Next is non-destructive editing and this is the one that we're looking for. Non-destructive editing means that we're not going to destroy any of the original data when we are doing our edit. The other option on here, non-permanent editing, while it sounds like non-destructive editing, again, this is just another vocabulary term that isn't really used. The proper term we're looking for is non-destructive editing. We'll go ahead and press next. Our next question, when applying a filter to a text layer, how can you ensure that the type's editability is not lost? Option one, enable the type's editable permanence option. Option two, ensure that the document is saved as a PSD. Option three, convert the type layer into a smart object. And object four, rasterize the type layer after applying the filter. The first option here, enable the type's editable permanence option. This just isn't a thing. This is not a real option, so we'll throw that one out. Next, ensure that the document is saved as a PSD or Photoshop document. Now, this one is a little bit of a trick as well, a little bit of a trick question. PSDs are something that is generally considered to be an editable format, so this sounds like it would be the right option. However, there is a more correct option in our list here, and that would be convert the type layer into a smart object. The reason that the PSD is not the correct answer here is that it's specifically looking for what answer applies directly to the text and kind of that editing process. So again, the correct answer is convert the type layer into a smart object. Let's take a look at the last option though, rasterize the top type layer after applying the filter. 
This is the exact opposite of what we want, and this is the process that means that we will no longer be able to edit the text. So this is the direct opposite of what we want. Again, the correct answer, convert the type layer into a smart object. We'll go ahead and press next. Question five, when pasting information from another application into Photoshop, you can select which of the following paste as options, and it tells us to choose three. Making sure we read the question is important. This choose three tells us how many options we need to have selected here. The first option given to us is CSS. This is a language used in web design and doesn't really apply to Photoshop. We can throw that option out. The second option, mask, is another thing that sounds like it would be an option on here, but is not the correct answer. Masks are used within Photoshop, but you're not going to be pasting a mask into Photoshop. Next is pixels, and this is our first correct answer on here. We are able to copy pixels uh, into Adobe Photoshop. The same thing applies for paths and smart objects. All of these we are able to use as paste as options inside of Photoshop. So these are the correct answers here, pixels, paths, and smart objects. SVG is going to be a vector graphic, uh, and vector is also going to be a vector graphic. Photoshop is not a vector-based program, and so we're not able to paste these into Adobe Photoshop. We'll go ahead and hit next. Question six is where we come to our first task-based question. In this question, it's saying change the grid lines to dashed with grid line every 64 pixels and one subdivision. Show the grid if it is not already showing. So this is two different steps. First, change the grid lines to dashed with grid line every 64 pixels and one subdivision. And second, show the grid if it is not already showing. We'll start with the first part here, changing the grid lines. To change our grid lines, we're going to go to edit at the top go down to Preferences, and we're going to go to General to start off. Next, on the left-hand side, we're going to go to Guides, Grids, and Slices, and you'll see that we have an option for Grid inside of here. The color we can leave as is, but what we are interested in is this line right here. We're given three different options, a solid line, a dashed line, or a dotted line. The question asks us to use a dashed grid line, so we'll go ahead and select the second option, that's our dashed. Grid line should be set to every 64 pixels, so if it's not already, we'll type in 64 right here. And we're going to make sure this dropdown is set to pixels, and now that part is very, very important. Make sure you do that. It tells us that we should have a subdivision of 1, so again, if that number is not 1 already, we'll type in 1 right there. Go ahead and press OK. It is very important that we do the second step here as well. Show the grid if it is not already showing. We'll go up to View at the top, go down to Show, go to Pixel Grid is what we're looking for. So on this pixel grid here, we're just going to make sure we have a check mark enabled, which we do right here. But if you don't see a check mark next to Pixel Grid, click that option and it should pop up. Once we've done all of that, we'll go ahead and select Next, and Gmetrics will check our work and we are again correct. This next one is a question about tools and which tools you are familiar with. This one tells us to use the lasso tool and content aware fill command to remove the balloon from the sky. In order to select our lasso tool, we're going to use this button, this button right here over on the left and we're going to hold down on it and select the lasso tool. This icon might look a little different on your screen, so you may have to search around a bit, but we're looking for this uh, either circle or jagged polygon. Once we have the circle selected, we're just going to hold down on the trackpad with our left hand and draw a circle around the balloon with our right hand, and then we're going to let go. This will select the balloon for us, and then we can do Shift Delete or Shift Backspace to open up our fill menu. And we're going to make sure this is set to Content Aware. And then we're just going to go ahead and select OK. And just like that, our balloon has disappeared from the sky, nice and easy. We're going to go ahead and press Next to move on to the next question.
In task 8, we're told to create a new document made for HDV or HDTV 720p video. Name the document movie, except all other default settings. So we have two really important components here, creating a new document made for HDV 720p video. So that's our first step. And second, we need to name the document movie. To create a new document, we're going to go to File, and then go to New. And then we're going to go to video at, or film and video at the top. We'll select HDV. And then we're going to change the name right here to movie. We're just going to go ahead and click create and then select next. And that is our first eight questions finished. At this point in time, for the sake of the assignment, we're going to need to turn in our summary page just to show that you've been following along and doing these steps yourself. To access your summary page, click on summary at the bottom of Gmetrics, and then we're going to use Windows F10 to take a screenshot. In this screenshot, we can only see that we have a check mark next to the first five questions, so we will have to turn in two different screenshots here to make sure that we can see all eight of these first questions. So we'll scroll down just a little bit and then do Windows F10 again to take our second screenshot. We'll turn in these screenshots on Google Classroom in order to receive credit. If you already know how to do that, you can stop watching here. But if you need to know how to find your screenshots, we'll go ahead and show that as well. Go down to the File Explorer at the bottom, and then we're going to go to Pictures on the left, double click on Screenshots, and all of our screenshots are located inside of here. The screenshot that you're looking for is probably whichever screenshot has the highest number on it. That's the most recent one. But that's going to wrap up this video. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye now.